and I will be chairing this session. So I'll be um, hopefully uh, getting a lot of um, reactions and discussion from this audience. Um, we've got a panel of three today. Um, to my left is Lucille, who's from IIED um, and has a really um, interesting crossover background um, between um, development and humanitarianism and um, urbanism. So uh, we'll hear from uh, Lucy, we've got Jim uh, Robinson here today from NRC. Again, another really interesting um, background um, in the context of shelter, um, looking at uh, a lot of the legal issues around um, land and housing and property. Um, and online, we've got um, Estella Carpi, uh, who was hoping to be here today, but um, is going to be uh, dialing in. Um, I think what I'm going to do just for technical reasons is um, start with the uh, people who are in the room. I hope that's okay, Estella, and I hope you can hear me. Um, and then we'll pass over um, uh, to go to our web-based participant. Okay, so um, Jim, would you like to kick us off? I mean, we're here to discuss climate change and shelter and, and those kind of things. And um, so I'm not going to reiterate the kind of the states that we're in, as we've heard, heard about that this morning. Um, and what I wanted to just share about is a, a, a project that we're starting, um, a partnership with the government of Liechtenstein um, between um, NRC and um, I coordinate the housing, land and property uh, responsibility with the Global Protection Cluster. So it's the HLP AOR GPC. So three three letter acronyms all in one go, which is a, a real bargain. Um, but yeah, so we're starting this project because we're trying to make some of those links between that humanitarian response that looks, you know, is a response and the uh, kind of longer term planning, development, preparedness, uh, policy changes that we've been already talking about this morning, but seem very difficult to try and join up. So. Um, to be totally honest with you all, this is a, a compilation based on an event we did just Wednesday this week um, at the Humanitarian Network Partner Week, which brought together some practitioners from Somalia, Mozambique and uh, the Pacific. And we were starting to try and discuss these issues. So I wanted to share a little bit of the insights that they shared with us and just to uh, kind of get some thoughts, because this is a early stages project and it would be great to hear from you. So firstly, what is HLP? Well, who knows what HLP is? One, two, ooh, yeah, a few people, that's good. Not always the case, so I'm pleased to see a few. Anyway, essentially housing, land and property um, is, about, is about a home. It's about being able to live fear from, free from the fear of forced eviction and, and all the things that we think about with the home. So it's about links to kind of livelihood. It's about links to uh, safety, being able to uh, educate your family, uh, all those kind of things. And we, we see a lot of, uh, consideration given to uh, the need for you know that, that physical structure but we also need to think about the land that that's on how do we make that secure for people how do we link that into their lives as, as, as a full thing um, so HLP rights go, go beyond ownership so uh, all sorts of rights so the same piece of land can have lots of uh, rights attached to it for example we use this kind of bundle of sticks so which is behind the d but imagine a bundle of sticks um and that might be people can use a piece of land for for their livelihoods it might be that people have access they can walk through use use a piece of land with their uh, their animals for example um all sorts of things um hlb rights can be uh, held collectively individually um, they can be documented officially by the state, you know, signed, sealed, delivered, or they might not be. They might be customarily owned or they might be held informally. And just because they're not written down doesn't mean those rights don't exist. So HLP essentially is about its rules and arrangements that, that, that identify and clarify people's relationship to their land that they live on and that they use. Um, and as I said, it's not just about uh, laws. It's about all sorts of ways that communities navigate and negotiate this, this idea. So oh dear. there is a, a complexity. So, for example, just a little diagram around sometimes uh, the legal pluralism that can exist, particularly around land, you know, different ways of understanding a connection to a piece of land, something that was uh, connected through the family, something maybe that there was a transaction around. Maybe there's some, a piece of land that is, has always been used by uh, a particular community 
uh, for their for their for their life for their livelihoods or for all sorts of reasons and then when you add in kind of rights to be able to mine a piece of land um, and how the transactions happen then if you add in kind of conflict scenarios where maybe that land is now controlled by a non-government authority of some kind and yet people are still wanting to have a transaction around that land you get really really lots of lots of uh, complexity hence the, the bundle of sticks and also you have to mind the gap between law and practice because it's always there you know things can be written down in a really nice way doesn't mean that they are, are applied in, in in the real world as i'm sure you all know um so that's the the little primer on hlp and um when we see climate change having an impact we we see additional hlp uh, protection challenges that arise so Often the assumption is that when someone has to leave their home because of a disaster, they will just return there at some point when the hazard ends. But one of the things we're seeing, although this is the case, sometimes uh, the combination of insecure HLP rights makes that very difficult because how do you identify and prove and claim your connection to a piece of land? Uh, and also there might be another barrier just in terms of that land is no longer safe. It doesn't become habitable in the same way so we're seeing increasingly um, repeat events you know Mozambique's an example where there's been you know, an increase in the number and the ferocity of cyclones in recent years and that's really changing things South Sudan we see flooding that doesn't disappear before the next rains come so it's um it makes land less available and that increases more tensions and uh, issues around around the land People might also need to settle in, in areas of land that actually are unsafe. And so we need to think about what is the relationship to that land? How do we build in thinking about climate vulnerability to, um, to, to helping people settle, supporting people in that process? So a couple of uh, examples that have, uh, we've been um, through sort of some of the partners we've been working with. So talking about Somalia, um, where there's been, you know, an increase in climate related uh, sort of hazards you know we see lots of drought and floods recently there's also a context of a lot of conflict that's still going on on and on and on it goes um and what we see that climate change has an impact on on people securing their their hlp rights uh it makes things more complex around hlp you know if you lose your documents because either you've had to leave because there's been flooding or you moved on that can cause a problem if things haven't been clearly mapped or understood before you have to leave then that can cause cause a problem in terms of thinking about return um some of you may know about the uh, area by doa and um, where there's been massive displacement to that place so around 430,000 idps are there currently uh, internally displaced people are there currently and and a large amount of them have arrived since various kind of droughts and, and floods but particularly a drought in 2017 um, and what happens when lots of people arrive in a place well they try and settle they try and create some kind of home for themselves but there's uh, this is normally done informally and um, they might join the existing settlements that are there um, there can then be an increased competition for resources um, difficult to try and like, create a livelihood opportunities, what's there, uh, competing over um, access to water, all sorts of things. And it can leave them very vulnerable to um, forced evictions and like, further homelessness. So some of the factors that have um, led to this increased uh, danger of, of eviction have included, um, you know, the reliance on sort of verbal tenancy agreements. So uh, just trying to make some kind of agreement in the short term that's going to work. Increasing land values as more people need less land. The sort of accelerated and unplanned urbanisation. Um, IDP settlements being commodified. There becomes there's a market around, around people needing to be in places and all the supplies that go there. Increasing just other property acquisitions. So the power dynamics come in. People want, want the land for other things. They see a value in it. That can cause uh, equal problems as well. And then just the, the wider context of a very limited legal and policy framework around HLP rights um, and a rise in land disputes. And women particularly have to face extra challenges in terms of accessing justice. Um, you know, culturally, there, there's a, it's quite a patriarchal society, so that, that creates some difficulties as well. And so there's an increased risk of HLP violations and we're also seeing land grabs that are triggered by by these events so if people leave a place then people try and uh, uh, take over over that land so 
it's interesting because these issues aren't unique to uh, you know climate related events, but the impact of the number of of climate hazards that is causing people to have to leave is having a cumulative effect that's increasing the numbers of people who are having to, uh, to, to leave their homes and, and try and find homes elsewhere. So these are specific challenges to the Somalia context, but I think are applicable in, in many other places as well. Um, there's a very limited sort of understanding of the link between HLP and, and climate change. And that's why we're trying to start, start looking at this issue from a practical, pragmatic way. How do we actually see what's being done in different places uh, to, to try and address some of these things? There's work that needs to be done on the policy side. There's definitely a limited understanding and capacity in terms of expertise being able to engage in these things. And there's this uh, preference for life-saving interventions that you know, we, we see with good reason, people need food, et cetera. Um, but if you don't address the underlying housing, land and property issues, you are creating you know, problems longer term and often a, a kind of a cycle of, of, of problems as well. And um, some of the responses to these have been to um, start to actually develop specific toolkits that allow people, local communities and the humanitarian uh, agencies, but also kind of community based organisations to address some of these HLP issues. So actually getting ahead of the game and trying to map out clearly what, what people's living situations are before there's a flood, before there's a drought, rather than trying to do it reactively. Um, there's a need for a lot of analysis to understand what's going on. Assessments need to be done to really understand what the issues are and um, better work to sort of facilitate access to secure kind of tenure arrangements to connections to the land. Uh, how long have I got left, by the way? 30 minutes, yeah. <laughs> 30 minutes left, apparently, no, 30 seconds. Okay, just quickly to show you um, with some dodgy formatting, um, just a, a, a different side of, of, of the impact of climate change on HLP. So this is the kind of slow onset. So this is in the Solomon Islands where um, this island, uh, uh, Walande, uh, you can see the sea level rise is creeping up. There's also other issues as well um, in that the, the cutting down mangroves and things that have also kind of led to the erosion of of, of the the kind of the ground underneath um so people are and this is sort of customarily held land so it's, they don't have that secure uh, ownership right that we might understand in a kind of formal state way so what happens when they move from that island they have to try and negotiate and find a way to um to uh, to sort of securely settle another island in the same in, in Solomon Islands as well. And people are moving from there and they're going straight into this informal settlement, uh, uh, which again, leaves them without any kind of rights to, um, to, to safely stay there um, that are realized. So um, I'll stop there because I'm out of time, but just to say, we're trying to explore this issue. And I'd love to hear if you have ideas around uh, projects, programs, things that are happening, things that you hear about local governments or communities are doing, where they're really kind of sort of trying to see this link between land rights and making people more secure in their connection to the land and maybe that extra risk of uh, climate related hazards. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Um, I have to explain very briefly who I am, I think, for this presentation to make sense. So I work for IIED in the Human Settlements Group. That's the International Institute for Environment and Development. We should really be called the urban group. That's something I've been pushing because basically we're a group of urban researchers. Uh, it's a research institute. Some people call it a think and do tank. I should say we do more thinking than doing. And my work at the moment is quite academic. So I'm not, I've not always been an academic um, and it's been lovely to see some former colleagues here in the room, um, some old faces catching up. Uh, but yeah, at so the moment my work is quite academic and I um, am supposed to raise money for academic research with policy impact and bring that in from donors like UK Research Councils or maybe the FCDO, um, sometimes philanthropies as well. Uh, and at the mo my work is mainly at the moment focused on forced displacement into urban areas and looking at conflict affected populations. The rest of the Institute does nothing on conflict <laughs> and they do a lot of work on climate change who's kind of in the title of IIED. And I'm thinking I need to make my work more relevant to my colleagues, all the rest of them who are, who are a bit surprised to find somebody working on urban refugees in their midst. So for me, it seemed like a natural thing. Well, let's think about forced displacement and mobility in a context of climate change. I think it's very difficult to talk about climate migrants. You're definitely not supposed to talk about climate refugees because UNHCR gets terribly upset about that. But one thing we do know, it's very hard to say who is a climate migrant because you ask someone, why have you moved? 
they'll give you all sorts of reasons and many of them will have nothing to do with climate but there may be a climate factor underneath all of that things linked to particularly to livelihoods change and so on but labeling someone a climate migrant is very very difficult um so climate change in an era of mobility no mobility in an era of climate change <laughs> just probably both um, at the moment, I'm involved in a peripherally involved in a project run out of the new school with Shack and Slum Dwellers International, who are a federation of the urban poor in about 30 countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, and uh, this project is mainly um, producing quantitative data. Uh, it's a survey in four coastal cities in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's uh, 1,200 households interviewed in, have been interviewed in Monrovia, Freetown, Accra and Dar. And the idea is to look at how people are, why people have moved. It's a survey with my people who are not born in the city, why they've moved and what impacts they've felt from climate change in the city. Um, and this is building on SCI's longstanding history of enumerations where um, in order to gain secure tenure to land, they map informal settlements where they live um, and then take that data on numbers of people, services, risks to local government to eventually be recognized as residents. There's definitely a link with the HLP work. And the survey has, uh, it. there are some pictures of, every, every household is a picture of the house. There's some information about household characteristics, assets, proxies for income. Um, and then there's a small section on the migration journey. Where was this person born and where were they living last? Which is sometimes where they were born, but it's sometimes somewhere else in the country or indeed in a city. Um, and then the question about why did you leave? And there is people asked about socio, so social reasons, family reasons, economic reasons, and also asked about environmental reasons. And apparently so about 10% of people say, talk about the environmental reasons. So it's not like top of the list. But then there are also about the, the, there's information on the impacts of destination uh, around climate change. And there's 30% uh, of respondents have said they've had some kind of, they sort of damages, they've experienced damages as a result of generally it's flooding, tidal waves. Um, and I'm assuming in Freetown that's probably um, risk landslides or as well. And then there are also about their future thoughts about moving. So this project is quite small this project ran out of new school and there's not much time to dig into the data. And I'm thinking right now's an opportunity to get a ready-made survey and do something bigger with it. So in my remaining five minutes, there are two ideas that we could potentially pursue with partners in terms of research. I suppose my question is, are they both equally interesting and important? Is one better than the other? And that's kind of what I'd like to hear about. So my first idea was we've got the data where people have come from, and where they've ended up. Let's take that and find the clusters of where people are coming from in the rural areas. Uh, and that will take a long time because people might say, I come from X region, or they might say, I've come from this tiny town, or I've, just, you know, I've come from this mountain. It'll take a long time for a research assistant to, to track those and put, plot people on a map. But I'm assuming we'll find clusters of areas in the country where you're getting migration. I would suggest that we go to those areas and we start talking to people about why they're choosing to migrate and go into more qualitative work to understand that. Why are people migrating out of your area? Why have you stayed? Do you want to leave? Can you not leave? Are you stuck? There's a whole area of research on people who are stuck who can't actually migrate. But also do the work in the receiving areas in the city. What, and I had a really natty title for this. It's called Going With The Flow. And the idea was to understand how people and knowledge and money continues to move between rural sending and urban receiving areas. And the point of doing that is to start thinking about this is these movements as adaptation strategies. So migration is adaptation to climate change. Your rural area has sort of basically reached its capacity to support certain numbers of people because of the way that climate is impacting on agriculture or other livelihoods. We need to accept that that's gonna happen, that these flows from rural to urban are going to continue and we need to start planning for it better. So we try and bring in local government in urban receiving, rural sending areas, getting to talk to each other, think about what this might mean on a planning on a national level. If you understand better how your population is moving, how can you start planning for that better nationally as well as locally? And can you get civil society engaged? Um, certainly we, we're working with them already in these cities with SDI, rural areas possibly more difficult, but to make sure that people who are making that journey know what's gonna happen, what, how, they can, how they can make the most of, of 
life in the city when they get there and how in the city there can be more support for people to be integrated and to be safe because I think a lot of migrants do tend to end up in the most vulnerable areas of informal settlements when they arrive in the city and the academic argument for doing that was a lot of work on climate change and mobility is all about projections about oh these millions of people are going to be swarming into Europe I use that word on purpose very um uh, quite sort of racist uh, narratives around mobility of fear mongering picked up by the press. But actually, most migration is going to happen internally and uh, it's already happening. So, why are we like talking about projections? Why don't we find out what's happening and how it's happening now? And we tend to think about migration as one journey and then it stops. But actually, it's a system. And that's why I was talking about going with the flow like people and ideas and money and goods continue moving between places of origin. So, that's a research question. Number one. So recently I had a meeting with colleagues from CCI, which is uh, an NGO in Tanzania that's part of the Shack Dwellers International Federation, who have been part of this data gathering for the project that's being done at the new school. And they said, oh, what's really interesting about this work is that actually people are moving within the city. So migrants, when we asked them that question, where did you last, where were you last living before you came to this settlement? So well, they mentioned another settlement in the city. Um, and we want to understand why they're moving. Um, and so, okay, so the local partners are actually like, oh, your idea is quite interesting, but actually we're more interested in understanding what's happening within the city. So is there a possibility rather than the other research idea is to actually go back to some of these respondents if we can. I think, they're, I think their um, GIS locations are, are recorded. So actually we can go and find the same respondent and the people, and ask them to do a more detailed journey. So how, how many times have you moved around the city and why? And traditionally there's a lot of academic literature on urbanization that has sort of debunked these myths about people getting stuck in slums. Actually there's a lot of mobility. So there's a lot of work done on this ages ago in Brazil um, called the myth of marginality, where actually people are moving, have aspirations to move within an informal settlement to better housing. Um, and actually people aren't stuck and there's a whole kind of yeah, there's a whole market of housing market within informal settlements. And is this sort of moving around the city just that? It's just aspirational movement. Or is it distress movement? Are people moving because they are no longer able to live in the homes they were there before because of flooding or because of risk of landslides or because of heat stress, water shortage, any of those issues linked to climate change? And is it that with each move, actually, they're losing resilience and they're becoming weakened? sort of as a, as a family unit in terms of their income or their livelihood potential because they keep on having to move. So that's it, I have my 10 minutes. Which question is more interesting? Which one is more useful? Or should we do both? Or neither? I don't know. Should we just do some questions? Or yes. to... And does anyone have any questions for the speakers we've had so far? Or questions or immediate reactions to? Um, Jim's call for um, ideas, examples, um, knowledge sharing on HLP and shelter, and uh, Lucy's pitch for the two different research questions. Any reactions to that? Did you learn something? Um, either speaker, any questions or reactions? Yeah, uh, yeah I just want to come back quickly to your mention Oh, yes. Thank you. Hello. Hello, people. Uh, so I just wanted to come back quickly on your questions about whether number one and number two. And I think they both sound great. And obviously, they would be self uh, reinforcing, or they would build upon each other. I think they're both highly relevant. But if I had to choose one, I would choose a first um, to understand to, to have the resources to send a team up to the mountain or the lake or the, you know, the river, whatever, and to understand from those communities why they're leaving, the ones who stay behind as well. Um, that's absolutely vital and, uh, and so on. And, you know, to understand from them, well, you know, if there was just a decent school here or whatever, we'd stay because uh, you know, something like that. Um, and then what their experiences have been uh, in the urban area. And I completely agree with you. There's a lot of this focus or fear that there will be this sudden wave of migration outwards, transboundary, and that's not necessarily the case. I mean, it may happen, and perhaps that is happening. 
I'm just going to, sorry to cut you off there. We'll have more time for questions after Estella's talk and we'll come back to everyone. Okay. Are you ready? Can you hear us and ready to go? Are you happy to just uh, briefly introduce yourself and then um, we'll look forward to hearing your slides show? Of course. So, um, uh, hello everyone. I'm Estella Carpi. I'm a um, lecturer in humanitarian studies in the Institute of Risk and Disaster Reduction at UCL. I'm very sorry that today I'm unable to be uh, on campus, but just like I'm positive to COVID in all frankness. Uh, so luckily I, I'm, I'm dealing with mild symptoms. It's not that much, but I would have loved to be there in, uh, in person. So I, I would like to, um, like to premise uh, my presentation with a few words so saying that today I'm actually wearing my hat uh, like of Middle Eastern scholar uh, rather than humanitarianism scholar, right? Because I'm not, uh, I haven't particularly been concerned with climate or shelter in the past. Uh, but of course, um, I've been um, conducting extensive research on humanitarian responses uh, in Lebanon and in the Syria neighborhood uh, more in general. So um, what I aim to do today is rather providing you uh, with a political sociology of shelter needs and climate uh, in the region to try to understand what politi like local political responses um, are, are causing like political responses to, to climate and shelter needs and how they can uh, dramatically become a tool of soft power and also of geopolitical cooptation. And of course, like as humanitarian uh, researchers and operators, we all need uh, to, to deal with these, um, with these issues as well. So yeah, so first of all, um, like we are normally used to speaking of either forced or unforced migration, explaining them as one caused by persecution and violence and the other one as the result of a deliberate choice. But sometimes this labeling system of humanitarian action fails to capture the way in which migrations happen. So that's why I, I, I use the term of ungraspable categories here. Uh, and I would like to provide you with a couple of examples of how these ungraspable categories uh, can include or exclude people, can protect people sometimes, but in other cases, they can deprive them of their livelihoods. So first of all, um, of course, like we've got several examples of uh, legislation, international laws governing migration and asylum, but neither of them uh, really includes a possible um, category of climate uh, change refugees. So this is not seen yet, normatively speaking, as uh, um, a forced migration. Uh, not only in the 1951 Geneva Convention for Refugees and the 67 protocols that we are more um, familiar with as people based, let's say, in the, in the European region, geographically speaking, but not even in the organization of the African unity in 69. And um, so basically, in, in the modern legal protection system, this has not emerged yet. Um, and, and this phenomenon is still quite considered borderline with other kinds of forced migration and therefore put some programs in place that might not be seen as fully um, suitable, let's say. So the, the second example um, uh, here, uh, like it's, uh, it's about uh, northern Syria's inhabitants. Like if you are familiar with this region, I'm referring here to the Kurdish majority region of, um, of Syria that is also called uh, the Rojava. Um, so this area is historically disadvantaged. There were no food items beyond the staple food on local markets, especially before um, the Syrian uprising and, and revolution. Um, there was often there was no network for phone calls. Some of them didn't even own Syrian citizenship, and it's characterized by poor means of transport and infrastructure in general. So when the Syrian political and humanitarian crisis started in 2011, the worst off of this region capitalized on their Syrian passport to be able to seek asylum elsewhere. Um, but their vulnerability never 
directly derived from war per se, because it was something preceding all of these. But if they had migrated um, before 2011, the international community wouldn't have supported them in any way. So uh, instead, uh, they can be internationally classified as refugees right now, and they can finally look for better places to live and, and generate their livelihoods. Um, another um, example of how uh, like the labeling system uh, might engender some issues is uh, Northern Lebanese citizens that tried to reach Australia by boat, uh, by purchasing Syrian passports to be able to seek asylum outside of Lebanon. Uh, because I mean, as you might know, like in 2011, Lebanon, I mean, was not at war at that moment. Uh, so, um, North Lebanon, um, again, like Northeast Syria, is a chronically deprived area of the country with poor infrastructure and high rates of unemployment. So uh, their boat sank off the Australian coast and something like 13 people uh, died in, in 2013. So here I, I really wanted to begin with the problematic nature of this labeling system and how uh, both climate and the right to uh, a, um, a shelter like and, and dignity like are often defined by uh, by these uh, labeling system unfortunately um so uh, as i mentioned and, and and as you are aware there's no legal protection for climate change refugees that means that there's no normative acknowledgement in the humanitarian protection system about this group uh, of, of refugees. Uh, but also uh, what I would like to highlight here is that they are under-researched in the Middle East region, where conflict and religion have dominated the international literature, even at an academic level, where uh, normally like we have the privilege of conducting more long-term research. So not even there uh, much has been done. So this led many scholars to neglect the effects of the physical and, and the built environment on human life in the region, while religious and ethnic tensions have always been overemphasized and just connected to conflict without considering the role of political responses to climate and environment. So why is this um, uh, problematic? Because injustice in the Middle East has therefore mainly uh, be mainly associated with religiously and ethnically motivated conflict. So it just became about um, identity rather than resources. So in that sense, we can speak of uh, Middle Eastern exceptionalism, much to our dismay. Uh, but we also know that migration is not necessarily a crisis. Uh, it's also a positive adaptation mechanism to climate. Um, so if migration is not a crisis per se, it can translate into extreme vulnerability if appropriate measures are not put in place. So the causes of uh, climate change migration can range from deforestation to the um, intervention in the built environment as it happened uh, in the Middle East region. And, and all, of course, like all of these, as you can imagine, it's about political decision making. Uh, so the way such decision makers act can alter the physical environment and its resources, can cause more flooding and droughts uh, in the Middle East region, and they can even under equip a population when they need to face natural hazards. And here we have the uh, blatant example of places like Turkey and, and Istanbul, like when an earthquake happens or landslides. Um, so the construction of dams by the Turkish, Syrian and Iranian governments in particular in the area that is called ex-Mesopotamia, uh, led many local residents to leave forcibly and, and look for other cultivable lands. So um, we have an example in the 70s uh, by Syrian government that built dams in the border region with Iraq, especially in an area called Tabqa, that is near Raqqa, uh, near the Euphrates uh, River. 
So this caused the flooding of some Arab villages and the inhabitants were resettled in Kurdish majority areas, generating tensions because of course they wanted to kind of de-Kurdishize that area. So this caused the forced demographic uh, change. Another example, uh, just of course just, in brief, um, it's uh, Stella, yeah? I'm just gonna say, give you a one minute counting. Sorry, I can't give, show you a flashcard. Um, ah, just so that you allow time for the discussion. Oh. But it's oh, a, okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So just to say, I mean, we also have an example inside the Turkey uh, in 2020, where like, again, there were no settled, decent settlement conditions for the resettled and the Turkish government built a dam uh, also in this uh, Kurdish town. So the management of water and land resources actually was one of the main causes why, um, the main reasons why rural communities um, rebelled against the government government in the Syrian uprising itself, but this kind of went uh, overlooked. Uh, so uh, my uh, last input and, and advocacy point is about what I witnessed in the region throughout the years. So here I just posted a few images from uh, Aleppo, from Idlib, and also from Akkar, the northern Lebanese region, where unfortunately most of the refugee households, uh, what I witnessed is that they need to purchase uh, material uh, materials and try to uh, preserve like the structure of their shelters uh, throughout the years without finding material support from the organizations. So there's clearly a problem of outreach. And I close like with the sad note so that of course messages like this one by UNHCR uh, that I, I took the picture of uh, in 2016 doesn't help because it was even in English. Um, nowadays it's sent in Arabic, but as you can imagine many refugees um, they remained in Lebanon and are still in Lebanon nowadays. Most of them are actually barely uh, literate, uh, I can confidently argue, in the north of the country and mostly from a rural background in Syria. So, of course, even if you send out a message in Arabic, um, they still feel like they are lacking concrete assistance and they want the tangible presence of people that come to help when a storm or something like uh, other issues or a flood that <clears throat> is about to happen. So thanks for these. And sorry, like if I, I was about to run out of time. No, thank you so much. And I'm sorry we couldn't have you here. And um, for, uh, my, a personal reaction to this as chair, I will just make one reaction, which is um, I'm often very frustrated when um, humanitarian reporting about disasters gives context. And the context is 100,000 houses were destroyed. Uh, and what I want is the story about <laughs> um, why there was a landslip, like what was happening um, before. So to have that rich um, context about the land, the resources, um, the politics, um, what we're missing and not asking questions about is really fantastic um, and refreshing. So um, I want to, there were a couple of hands up with responses to the previous speakers. Um, so I'm hoping you've got a vote uh, on the questions, um, some contributions on other land work and um, responses to this rich um, story. I, I just wanted to remind everyone, and I'm going to have to ask Lucy to remind me um, about the places specifically that we've heard about. So um, is it uh, Beidoa in Somalia, Walandi in the Solomon Islands? And I didn't write fast enough to get the list of the places that you were talking about. Freetown and Dar, and Northern Lebanon and Northeast Syria. So really interesting, specific and different problems and places. Two questions were here, weren't they? I'm gonna, because I haven't seen you for ages. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, so Vicky Mercer, currently independent, I think probably easiest to say. Um, so I thought that the discussions were actually very interesting and thank you for that. Um, but in particular, I'm curious as to whether or not anybody has looked at um, the number of uh, conflicts that have been directly created due to climate change and economic circumstances um, that are actually causing stress within society. Um, that's pretty much it. Fantastic. I'm gonna get what I'll do while the um, speakers come to the front is just give another opportunity for a question. I'll write it down. Um, well, it's not a question, more of a response to Magnus's point and your question, I think. But um, I, sorry, Tom Newby, 
um, and I'm not sure. Well, an engineer. Um, <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I suppose my my reaction to the question is it's about it, as a practitioner um, thinking about what is more helpful as a practitioner. It feels like actually the probably the second one because I don't, and this is based on my assumption that I don't think we can or necessarily even want to stop migration from rural to urban. I think it's it's happened through the last 50 years across the world. It's, it's a force that keeps going. Uh, well, even longer, yes. Um, it's accelerated very much in the last 50 years. Um, so I suppose, and, and the practicalities of, and the costs involved with intervening rurally and whether you're helping enough people and, and cost effectiveness and so on, it gets very difficult. Whereas we do know that you have large numbers of people in urban areas who've migrated there who are very vulnerable and as you said maybe getting more vulnerable if they're having to move through distress or maybe improving their situation or actually probably you've got both going on so understanding that and what you can do about it feels to me as a practitioner like a much more helpful thing to be able to say what should a program look like i do think both questions are fascinating and important but as a uh, as guiding practice the second one feels perhaps more valuable so i'm going to go for a third question um, and then we'll see what the um oh, yeah second question Hi, Charles Parrock, Centre for Development and Emergency Practice, Oxford Brookes University. Um, I'm going to say the first question, I'm going to, this is a comment to Lucy, and I'm going to say the first question, <clears throat> because I thought the most, one of the most interesting things was about the uh, a migration as a coping strategy for climate change. And so if that's the heart of it, and because I think, you know, one of the most important things to say is what's the what's the question at the heart of what you're doing? And that for me sounded really interesting it is is that the migration is a coping strategy. So but then I'm not entirely sure what question that means about what you want to find out. <clears throat> but um, but that so so for me, it was it was more about asking people why they had why they had decided to come to the urban area. What was it about that they they had had to do, which was related to where they the area that they came from, and and why they'd made that decision, and what what the consequences were for that, about um, about whether they were going, and then what the future is, whether they were going to go back, or whether it was going to become a kind of relationship between the urban and the rural as a as, but in the context of it being a coping strategy. Hi, um, I had a, a question. Sorry, I'm Jenny Ashford. I'm from uh, NRC, um, and had a question um, for actually my colleague, um, more around the the housing, land, and property, and, and humanitarian assistance with um, with regard to the sort of changing environment. Where do you see the the sort of priority in terms of considering HLP and the places where people have come from, and whether there is whether they have options to return given changing environments versus um, in the places where people have migrated to and the, the sort of environmental challenges for host communities as well. And how do you, you sort of, where do you see the role of the humanitarian community specifically in that and, and how is that, that changing? Thank you so much. So we've had um, a question about conflict due to um, climate and this question um, the lot that you've just heard. So any responses from um, to those points or reactions? On the climate change and conflict, um, Estella, you might know more about that. I, I, I think there's quite a, a lot of work that is seeing that there's a link, but no one would want to say too much about the causality and how strong that is uh, at the moment, I think. But I mean, I'm in probably in a room full of academics who probably know a lot better the answer than I do. Um, but that's my sense that it's one of the factors that's around, particularly when things link to uh, kind of livelihoods or, you know, if it impacts people's ability to stay on the land that they've they've been on, um, then that can then sort of lead to those kind of things. But in terms of studies, I don't know, I'd be very interested to read more about these things. Um, so yes, people, if you have ideas, tell us. Um, 
shall I answer the other one as well? Yeah. Um, on that priority, oh gosh, I mean, big question. Um, I think firstly, if people have had to leave their homes, if they want to return, it's up to them. You know, it's a voluntary thing. They should be allowed to, the idea is to try and create a, a, a situation where you know, they they can they can return if, if they want to they can choose whether they you know want to kind of relocate or if uh, you know, or stay where they have ended up so so in terms of what we might do we might try and work with states and others to create conditions that make them be able to make that choice in reality often people when they move it's increasingly that they have to stay away for a long time uh, and I think what's the average length of time as 16 17 years I think that people are displaced so we're talking about the need to think longer term about where people are settling and how do we increase the security of like their relationship to that space in that place at the same time there's a question that came up last night in a discussion around permanence how how, how do we get the balance between helping people to feel more secure where they are and allow them to stay somewhere with and do that in a way that either doesn't upset the government or whoever the state that uh, are hosting them and and how do we do that in partnership with a community that they're now living in amongst potentially and i think there's real issues there in terms of access to natural resources that don't always get the attention they need so I mean, we've talked you know, about wood but also water what happens when you know you've got a thousand households now accessing a water uh, supply that previously was used for other things um so i think the big well the short answer is I think we need more kind of joined up thinking across um, humanitarian development, people who are talking about preparing better. Um, I think my big question to all of you here is how do we as a sector get better at doing the preparedness stuff as in actually funding it properly when we can often predict what's going to happen. Um, I could talk for another half an hour, so I'm going to stop. Um, Lucy, do you have any um, responses to that round of questions? And then You'll hear from Estella, and then there's a couple of questions on that. Um, so, yeah, on the question of conflict um, and climate change, um, I think from I have very limited understanding of this, but I think there are some people in my institute who have quite strongly held views that I think access to resources has always generated conflict and violence, um, but there have been some mechanisms to deal with that. Um, but in a, an environment of increasing scarcity, it's going to be more difficult to be able to sort of mediate between parties who are, have conflicting views about who should be accessing the resource and who shouldn't. But I think, it's, it's, um, as Jim has said, it's very hard, to, just as very hard to say that somebody is a climate migrant, I think it's very hard to say that conflict has been caused by climate change, because there are always going to be many, many factors. Um, on the on the sort of the question one or question two, I, mean, I think I probably answered my own question that they are linked. Um, I think if we if, if we're saying that the migration journey, we have to we can't see it as as just being a simple from going from one place to another. We know that it carries on. I think perhaps you need to understand why people are moving and then understand what their experience has been in the city, which includes onward movement generally, I would say. Um, and I think the point of it is if we think about sort of the anticipatory action, as Estella was saying, thinking about climate adaptation to climate change through migration. I think if we, if you're gonna see it as an adaptation strategy, you need to start planning for it. So you need to understand what, how people are moving, what their experiences are and how those could be better when, once they've got to a city and to get local governments to realize that, yeah, no, we're not gonna stop migrations going on in a really long time, but you can perhaps um, plan against the worst impacts. So having people as um, the guy, Achilles Kalergis, who's running the, the project in the new school, he says people are moving into danger, that's his words. And I think that's that's the probably the point of the project overall is think about how you, you don't, actually create a crisis out of a migration journey. Great. Um, Estella, have you got any remarks on that? I'm just, while you respond, I'm going to pass yeah. the mic back to the... No, I just wanted to, to emphasize the importance of making this knowledge transfer bilateral. Like, I mean, as Lucy was saying, like, um, Basically, we learn a lot from uh, refugees and their trajectories of migration, and these ends up informing our policies. But what I feel 
uh, is that like more information campaigns are needed for refugees as well. So here I get back to what Jim was pointing out. Uh, yeah, like uh, giving freedom, providing people with the freedom to return or to uh, undertake own or migration is absolutely important. But we need to take into account that sometimes uh, people might like, they, they can be informed properly and they are not uh, in some cases. They do find their own strategies, of course, uh, that not always overlap, like let's say with our official debates. Um, absolutely, I'm not saying that there's nothing in place that is, uh, is put by them, but still, I mean, there are there's some policy making there that should be made uh, clearer, um, uh, like to, to make uh, organizations and, and UN agencies uh, more accountable to the eyes of people. So I would advocate for more information campaign around uh, the causes of climate change. And uh, they, they, this is to say, like I try to, to argue, I mean, there's a lot in place uh, against uh, these political decisions by Middle Eastern governments. And of course, they know way more than us from outside about this issue. But what is done in terms of global agenda is not clear to people, uh, of course, because it's it's not their job. So uh, I would say let's trust uh, people's understanding of these phenomena because they characterize their everyday life. Uh, so yeah just advocating for, for more information campaigns. Thank you, thank you, that's great. And um, Tom is gonna read out a couple of questions that have come through online, and then I think we've got another question. So, um, yeah, first, uh, a question from Clara Blonde, who's an independent protection officer uh, for Jim. Uh, do you agree that strengthening, making by or making binding the frameworks for protection of IDPs, e.g. Kampala Con Convention, is also necessary considering the majority of forced displacement as a result of climate change is predominantly internal? Is there appetite movement towards this on the policy level? Um, and then, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then uh, a comment from Fiona Kelling, who's an independent shelter consultant, uh, um, in response to Lucy's question. Uh, she, Fiona would choose the first option. Uh, the second has in a way been done before, albeit in a more anecdotal, less policy focused way in books like Arrival City by Doug Sanders which explores how people move to and within the city and the relationships to rural areas where they've come from, as well as how they use some use social capital. Plus one of the key challenges of facing many global South cities, sorry, key challenges facing many global South cities is in migration without adequately planning, resulting in increasing informality and vulnerability to subsequent disasters, which I think is in line with what you were just saying. So it would be amazing to see that research, especially in secondary cities. So that's so, um, there's, what, did you have another question, Charles? Um, really yeah, and then we'll go back to the panel again. Thanks. I, I just uh, one of the things that came up in shelter projects was was the issue in, in migration about social cohesion and about the host population. So I wondered if you could make brief comments about, in terms of climate change, about the relationship with the host population. Brilliant. So we'll deal with those because there's three, I think, or three comments. Who wants to go first? Would you like to go first this time you see? Um, yeah, so thank you to Fiona, was it? Um, good point about Arrival City. I need to read that book again. Um, but yes, I think I think the point of there will be like adding the climate lens on top of what we already know about how people move around the city. I'm not sure how much that book, I think I never got past the first chapter actually. I'm not sure how much of it looks at climate. Um, and then the relationship with the host community, yes, that it has been part of the research that's already happened with, with Achilles Kologis' work. I haven't yet seen the data, but there's a series of focus groups talking about the extent to which migrants want to be integrated into the city, how much do they want to, how much do they engage with local people who are in the, in the areas where they're living? How much do they want to? Is it a permanent move? Do they want to be urban residents or is it a temporary thing they're going to save up the money and and, and go back home again so I think that's isn't we shouldn't assume that the migration journey is going to that people are going to stay forever we need to find out what it is that those people want in terms of how much integration and then there's a question about whether or not there's also whether it's creating additional tension that you have migration migrants coming into informal settlements where there's already um, poor basic services 
and sort of pressure on on land for housing um, in many cases. So is it actually increasing tension? Um, and that's something that the Shack and some Trails International traditionally haven't really worked on migrants or with refugees. Um, and they're a huge network. Um, and it could be really, they're sort of slowly in various countries actually becoming interested in looking at how do refugees, how can you work with refugees if you're setting up savings groups or advocating with the government for improved basic services when those people are actually not supposed to be living in places with encampment policies, people are not even supposed to be there. But these networks of the urban poor are starting to think about, well, you know, there are lots of refugees or migrants in the settlements where we're working. We need to start thinking about them as cities residents. And that's a sort of a very incremental change, but could be potentially quite powerful given the reach of some of these federations of the urban poor. Thanks, great questions. Um, I think, well, so on the Kampala Convention, um, that uh, in theory would make states look after those that have been displaced uh, within their borders. Um, I think we are seeing movement towards countries wanting to ratify that and, and actually put that into practice, really domesticate that. Um, certainly, I know there's a number of examples in West Africa where where countries are working on that um, and some of that is being supported by some of the kind of humanitarian networks in those countries as well um, I, I think there's an interesting question around the role of kind of that, those sort of normative um, instruments and you know policy and um, advocacy around those things because I think they can be very powerful but they have to be um, actually, you know, put into practice and often there needs to be a lot of work to support those things being made real um, and then not just being something that, that I signed up to um, and not uh, then done something with. Um, so I think it could help if there's a sort of an advocacy push around that. If, if, if people are willing to be trying to domesticate that, put that into practice, then let's hold them to account with that and think of ways to do that. Let's, um, yeah, see, I think there's a, a dual purpose there around advocacy and uh, policy as well as then the more sort of creative and helpful support to communities and those that are actually dealing with those processes. Um, I don't know if that sounded more cynical or less cynical than it was meant to, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, on the, the second question around sort of the host populations and migration, um, I mean, it's a sort of banal point in some ways, but you know, increasingly we're trying to talk about you know, displacement affected communities or displacement affected people. So we're saying that there are people who've had to leave their homes and move, and then there are people who are now affected by that movement. So um, I think that's massively important to uh, really try and consider when we're creating ways to work with communities that we, we, we include working with the local authorities, working with local communities, working to support those that have arrived in a place, uh, because we have to think of what does it mean for access to um, you know, things to do with livelihoods, to resources, uh, to um, yeah, what happens when the goodwill to welcome people into an area then becomes uh, something that lasts six months, a year, two years. Is that how are we going to make sure people aren't then in a situation that's going to turn into another source of, of conflict? We were discussing that around Ukraine last week um, with some colleagues just around how, you know, there's been a lot of informal ways that people are helping and supporting. And there's an amazing kind of solidarity for those that have had to leave their homes. But how do we make sure that doesn't turn into something that, that creates more tensions and problems in the longer term? And I think we see that in a lot of settings. So that requires definitely careful focus and arguably as much priority as, as anything else. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say on that. Thanks a lot. I'm going to go um, to Estella to see if there's any um reactions as well and uh, because we're in the main room where the food is i'm uh expecting people to charge in any minute so and um, when that starts happening I'll, I'll close this up um estella do you want to come back on any of those points particularly around the kind of legal yeah oh. i mean not legal i mean it's not really my, my 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 side of things let's say but like i was inspired by both james and lucy's words like um, about the need to um, to really understand the crisis, like in continuity, uh, to really try to to propose a good shelter program and address people's needs and reach out to populations that don't necessarily live in places that are like officially 
um, called like and defined um, camps or or something like this as as Lucy works in. I mean the the context of urban settlements that is way more challenging from a logistic uh, side of things. So what I I would advocate for is that even when things are challenging from a bureaucratic and the logistic perspective, we need to uh, remember that like all of these is quite fluid. Uh, unfortunately, in a sense, because it's very difficult to manage from a practical uh, side of things. But let's remember that uh, the, the, the outreach and the livelihoods of people and the understanding of what really underlies what we call crisis are all at the mercy of, uh, of our mistakes, like as, as researchers, as I mentioned, and as operators, of course. Fantastic, thank you. And um, there's a couple of more questions. I'm gonna, um, do you have a question? Because I'm gonna go to someone who hasn't asked one yet first, and then I'm gonna come back to um, this side of the room. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Sen. I'm, I'm a journalist and a migration student and researcher back at SOAS. Um, I pretty much agree what has been echoing among the panelists and some of the questioned um, makers regarding the fact that um, migration as a way of coping with um, climate crisis isn't as simple as it sounds, it involves a lot of factors. And I was wondering if uh, any of the panelists have any data um, about the, when it comes to the communities that they have been working with uh, regarding the social economic differences in the capital resources among the people who can migrate and those who stay back, the ability, uh, the, the, Migration is an option, but it's but the ability to do so and the resource involved isn't the same for everyone. So yeah, if you have any study or insights on that, thank you. So please keep these final questions brief because I want to get a response to that great question. <laughs> thank you. Um, Lizzie Babister from the, um, the shelter cluster. It was just a really simple thing in response to um, Lucy's question about the questions, um, which was, it sounds like really, really exciting opportunity. The very exciting bit for me was when you went back and you asked what people were interested in on the ground, um, because that sort of said something about the opportunity that, that you have as an academic. And, you know, there are different stakeholders in the project, and there's probably your organisation, there's probably your donor, um, but to actually raise up your participants as a stakeholder and to use the access you have to them to uh, you know enable them to have an input in the research design and the question um, is a really exciting opportunity so for me the content wasn't necessarily so much um, the important bit although you know you will have an idea of what's missing in you know the knowledge that's out there but if it's knowledge that they can take and use that's really exciting is it a question? Please keep it quick because I just I'm scared quick. we're not yeah. going to have a chance. Hi, this is for, for Estella, really. Um, and she was talking about Northeast Lebanon. And I know some communities up there that uh, is 50 50 host refugee, massive environmental problems uh, for the agriculture there. Has any studies been done on the kind of lumpy infrastructure work that Kate was talking about yesterday? Uh, the, to to make it work for the host community and the refugee community, but it requires major you know infrastructure, and it connects a bit to what Lizzie was saying this morning about environmentalism versus humanitarianism, and is there some middle ground there? Maybe, but what do we know about these kind of projects? Have they happened? Do we need studies, or has it not really taken place because it's big lumpy infra? Thanks, great. So I'm going to go back to the panel. Any responses to those um, points and questions? Okay. Um, I need to just do some Googling to find the name of the fantastic academic who's really led the research on immobility. And I cannot remember her name, but when I find it, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, and to Lizzie's point, yeah, I mean, the way that IID works, I have to plug, give us a plug. We do our research with our local partners who are very often involved in co-producing the research questions and involved in data gathering and analysis. Um, I do think though that we asked, if we asked the government of um, Tanzania or even the municipality of Dar es Salaam, they might have different questions they were interested in. And ideally 
the project would actually be able to speak to those different audiences that um, we don't yet have a donor, well, there's a donor in mind. I guess the question is whether or not we can do, how much research we can do within the budget envelope. Um, but yeah, I can't, having the having partners tell me, oh, we're interested in question two, I can't, I really can't do, not, I can't not do question two. Um, and certainly as part of us, also ID trying to decolonize its research, um, is that we also need to make sure that we're um, like, facilitating flows of money to organizations in non-Western countries so they can do the research that interests them. So yeah, I'm definitely going to do question two. The, question, the point is whether or not we can also do question one, I think. Thanks, Lucy. Um, Estella, you can't see, but everyone's starting to come back into this room. So I'm gonna call a close to this um, session. And I just want to thank um, the speakers very much for their preparation and contribution and responding um, to uh, the input from the audience as well. Thanks for your participation and uh, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>